Hi, I'm Hank Zona, and I have a passion for wine. I grew up in a family with immigrant grandparents, and wine was a big part of everyday life. As I got older and my interest in wine grew, I wanted to learn as much as I could about it. And as my knowledge increased, I kept coming back to my roots with wine. Wine is something we share with family and friends. It's for fun. It's for pleasure. Now I want to share my knowledge and passion for wine with you. Please join me as we explore wine from all different angles on The Grapes Unwrapped. Hi again everybody, I'm Hank Zona of Swirl Wine Events. Welcome back to The Grapes Unwrapped. Today's show is going to be about sparkling wine. Sparkling wine and champagne doesn't have to be a black tie affair. We're going to show you here how it's an everyday drink and it's an every occasion drink. One of my favorite movies is The Philadelphia Story. Jimmy Stewart in Philadelphia Story has a line where he says, Champagne is funny stuff. I'm used to whiskey. Whiskey is a slap on the back. But champagne is a heavy mist before my eyes. What I'm going to try to do here today is to give you a good user guide on sparkling wine and champagne, teach you the buzzwords, and really try to demystify the mysteries behind sparkling wine and champagne. When we come back, we're going to start talking about the different styles of champagne and sparkling wine. We're going to talk about the grapes that go into it. We're going to talk about a whole range of things, including some food pairings as well. We'll be back in a moment. I want to introduce Linda Kennedy, who is the owner, the, uh, the, the, the creative mastermind behind L'Entrepot Design. Um, Jim and I thought that your space was really one of the coolest spaces here in Maplewood and would be a great place to, to film the show. And sure enough, you, you were amenable to it, which we were really grateful for. Tell us, about, tell us about your business. Tell us about the space here. Well, I found the space uh, about 11 and a half years ago. And when I found it, there were cars parked in here. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, oh, what a wonderful place to have an antique warehouse business. So I turned it into this, and it's been so much wow. fun. Enjoyed it. I just needed to power wash the inside, <laughs> the floor, the, the walls, and then, you know, you just create, and it, it, it's been a joy. So you've been in the design business for 16 plus years? 16, 16 plus years. Right. Mm -hmm. And you've had the space for most of that time. How long did it take you to get it ready? Probably four months or so, and because wow. at that point, I just had uh, special pieces in my basement, and the basement was getting a little <laughs> bit crowded. I live in Maplewood, so mm -hmm. I was driving around, and I saw a for rent sign, and I immediately stopped, called, and, and inquired about the space. So you can think about things that you can do, and, yeah. and the beams were here for the chandeliers, mm -hmm. and... Uh, my husband is nice enough to get up on a ladder and hang <laughs> these, and it's been very energizing. So most people stumble across your space, right? Because they, they drive by, they see the door open, you're here only on Sunday afternoons, mm -hmm. and, um, and they look in and they see just this really, really cool space the minute you open the door and look in. Thank so, you. So we appreciate you letting us, to be, letting us be here. To, well, I'm to so thrilled that you are here. Thanks. Right. 56% of all Americans say they really don't know what constitutes good champagne or sparkling wine. So after watching this show, you're going to be firmly planted in the other 44%. I guarantee you that much. But first of all, let's define what sparkling wine is. Sparkling wine isn't necessarily champagne, but all champagne is sparkling wine. In fact, champagne makes up only about 10% of all the sparkling wine that's made in the world. And, and sparkling wine comes in a, in a whole range of styles and really comes from all over the world. And we're going to start to talk a little bit about some of those different styles right now. The first sparkling wine I want to talk about is Prosecco. Why? Right now it is by far the fastest growing sparkling wine in the market. In fact, Champagne sales are down, other types of sparkling wine sales are kind of flat, but Prosecco just keeps growing and growing and growing. It is a sparkling wine, it is probably made in one of the more simpler manners. Uh, sparkling wine, in order to become sparkling, you make a still wine and then it undergoes a second fermentation. More expensive champagnes and, and other method champenois or champagnes or sparkling wines made in the that champagne method, undergo a second fermentation in the bottle. It's a much more labor-intensive method. Most Proseccos undergo a second fermentation, but in a tank. Much less labor-intensive, and it's a reason why the wine is so popular is because it is a lot less expensive. One of the reasons it's less expensive is because it's less labor-intensive. Now, 
Prosecco, like other sparkling wine, comes in two different styles, frizzante and spumante. If you see a Prosecco with a screw top, if you see a Prosecco with a cork top, which is what most people have seen, this is frizzante. Cork top, screw top, frizzante means lower fizz, lower pressure. Spumante style, and I chose this one because it's my daughter's name. Uh, spumante style, I don't know if the wine's any good by the way, um, has the traditional wire basket on top and the foil. Higher pressure, needs that cork, needs that wire basket to keep it on top. Again, these two wines are sparkling Zweigelts from Austria. This one again is more spumante style. You can tell by the wire basket there, even through the foil. The second one here again, frizzante or lower fizz, and you can see that that's a screw top. Both delicious wines, both made from the same grape, but made in a different style, one with a higher fizz and one with a lower fizz. I want to talk about another category of sparkling wines. These are red wines that sparkle. And what I have here is the Lambrusco. I love Lambrusco. I featured it in our first show at Arturo's. This is an incredible food wine. You also see sparkling Shirazes from Australia. Their, their taste is a little bit different from the other sparkling wines that we're, we're, we've been talking about in that these are, don't happen to be sparkling wines that are red, but they really taste more like a red wine that has a sparkle or a fizz to it. Uh, why is that different? It's a wine that you might want to have with a sturdier or heavier meal. It's a wine that, uh, that really has a, more of a red wine profile, but you've got that extra fizz that cuts through a lot of layers of heat and smoke and spice and, and different types of mouthfeels. Um, but, but if you're looking to pair up with food, I would grab this more as a red wine pairing than I would use it as a sparkling wine pairing. But still, delicious wine, great food wine. Hey Hank, I really like Sancerre, the Sauvignon Blanc grape from the Loire, but it's really expensive. I was hoping you'd be able to suggest some alternatives. Howard, that's a really good point you make and an excellent question. I've talked about Sancerre on other shows, and to me, Sancerre is the most beautiful expression of Sauvignon Blanc, and that's what is in a Sancerre. It's 100% Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, but Sancerres get expensive. It's, it's rare to find one under $20. They can be more expensive than that. But if you shop around, you may be able to find a good one in a low to mid-teens to high-teens range. But there are alternatives, and right from there in the Loire Valley as well. You can get a Sauvignon Blanc from anywhere in the world, but it's going to have a characteristic of those regions of, of the world as well. So uh, it might be oaked, it might be more citrusy, it might be more herbaceous. But to get that crisp minerality that you, that you find in a Sancerre, you'd have to go to other parts of the Loire. And this is a, a good example of not just a specific wine, but a, um, a specific area of the Loire, the terrain region. And, um, and I find that wines from terrain, uh, also 100% Sauvignon Blanc, tend to have that same racy minerality that a Sancerre has as well, and often you'll find them for a good $5 a bottle cheaper. Uh, here, here's what really helps though, to have a good relationship with a wine store. They will let you know when there is a good deal coming in on Sancerre. They'll let you know if it's probably less expensive because it comes from a cooperative, or maybe they got a deal on it because they directly imported it. Um, these are good questions to ask if you really are a Sancerre fan and if you want to uh, not just build the collection but drink them on a more regular basis without breaking the bank. The folks in Champagne are very protective of their name. So by law, a wine cannot be called Champagne unless it's actually made in the Champagne region of France. So how do you know what is a sparkling wine? How do you know what's comparable to Champagne? Again, the names, are, the names come into play here. This is an American wine, and it is known as, it's called a sparkling wine, but you'll see on the label here, it says Method Champenoise, which means it is made in the same style, the same manner that champagnes are made, uh, but again, they cannot call this a champagne by law. Spanish sparkling wines are known as cavas. Cava meaning cave, because that's where they, they store them and keep them. This is one cava here, and here's a rosé cava. Cavas are an excellent value because they're made in the Champagne method, but they use native Spanish grapes. 
the cost of labor is also a lot less in in, uh, in Spain. The cost of growing grapes is a lot less than in Champagne. So that's passed along to the consumer in a much less expensive wine. The traditional Champagne grapes are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Different blends of those go into different grapes, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But in the case of Spanish Cavas, they're using native Spanish grapes, both for the white and for the rosé. The last wine I have here to show you right now is a Cremant. Cremant is a French sparkling wine not made in Champagne. This is from the land of my peoples, from Alsace-Lorraine, and it's a beautiful sparkling wine. It's a Brut Rosé, and they use the same grapes that they're using in Champagne. This is made from Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier and Chardonnay, but again, because it's not from Champagne, even though it's in France, it's called a Cremant. You'll find Cremant d'Alsace from Alsace. You'll find Cremants from Burgundy. You'll find sparkling wines from the Loire. Beautiful wines, fantastic wines, and often really at a fraction of the cost of real champagne. One of my favorite wine quotes of all time really speaks to the versatility of sparkling wines and champagnes, and it's by Dame Lily Bollinger uh, of the famous Bollinger Champagne House. And Lily Bollinger used to say, I drink champagne when I'm happy and when I'm sad. Sometimes I drink it when I'm alone. When I have company, I consider it obligatory. I trifle with it when I'm not hungry, and I drink it when I am. Otherwise, I never touch it unless I'm thirsty. There's a place not so far away, a place where you don't have to keep the volume down. You'll find all sorts of creatures in this place without have to. The silly you, the proud you, you may even meet the curious you. You! 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 Ask your parents to take you to this not so far away place. Come to the forest, where the other you lives. But first, stop by discovertheforest.org. A big part of demystifying sparkling wines and champagnes is knowing some of the buzzwords that are on the labels of the wines. So you're not standing there misty eyed in front of the sparkling wine section in the wine store or pouring over the wine list at your favorite restaurant. First wine here is a Blanc de Blanc. If you see a Blanc de Blanc, that means it is made 100% of white grapes. In Champagne, that means it's made from 100% Chardonnay, nothing else. Other parts of the world, they might mix in some Pinot Blanc or other white grape, but even, even in most cases, you'll find it means Blanc de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay. The next wine I have here is a Blanc de Noir. Blanc de Noir means just the opposite. It's made 100% of the red grapes. The two principal red grapes, again, from Champagne, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier. That's what you're going to find in most Champagnes. You'll find them, again, in most Method Champenoise wines. Um, or you might find some other local red grapes as well. Next one I have here is a Brut. Brut means dry. There's different classifications of sweetness, if you will, uh, with sparkling wines and Champagnes. Brut being dry but not the driest. The driest level is a Brut Zero, a Brut Natural, which you're not going to find many of here in the United States. Next would be Extra Dry, which is actually less dry than the Brut. After that, you would have Demi Sec or Deux, which is a sweetened wine. I'm going to come back in one moment and talk about the Demi Sec. A little bit more, though, I want to talk about this wine right here, the Mirabelle. Mirabelle is a second label of Schramsberg, and Schramsberg, I, I think, is really the premier sparkling wine house in the United States. Uh, Schramsberg also happens to be the official sparkling wine of the White House. Mirabelle being the second label means you can get a similar quality sparkling wine from that house, probably about 5 to $10 cheaper than the Schramsberg label itself. This here being, again, the Brut. Brut means it's probably not just dry, but also most typical of the house style, if you will. If you want to find out really what the style of winemaking is for any particular sparkling wine or champagne house, try their non-vintage Brut. That'll give you the best indication. Back to the Demisec for a moment, but first I want to talk about Gruet, the winery. Gruet was a champagne family that over 30 years ago came to the United States looking for a place to open up a sparkling wine winery that best replicated their property in Champagne. They went through Oregon and through Washington, through California, and settled on New Mexico. 
people say New Mexico, and New Mexico's got about 50 wineries right now. Gruet is a really good producer of really good value sparkling wines of all kinds. Uh, typically, you get around a 90-point rating, so it's a, it's a uh, critically well-received wine, but I think this is an excellent wine to have for a large group of people. It's also an excellent wine just to have a bottle of wine. Demisec means that the wine is sweeter. What makes a wine dry, what makes a sparkling wine sweet, it's called dosage. The way sparkling wines are made is, first, a still wine is made. After that still wine has fermented, it is bottled, and a tirage is added. That tirage is a combination of yeast and sugar. The amount of sugar depends on if they want that wine to be brut or demisec, or sweet. The more sugar, the sweeter it comes. And then what happens with these champagne bottles is they are racked and they are turned every day by hand. Again, this is the labor intensive aspect of champagne making. And they're turned daily and they're tilted downward. So over the couple of years that they are aging, the dead yeast and other sediment comes to the neck of the bottle. Neck of the bottle is then frozen. The plug is pulled out. It's then filled up with the dosage depending on if they want this to be a brut or a demi-sec or whatever type of sparkling wine they want. Cork is put on, wire basket goes on there. Demi-secs are really nice. This is a really good dessert sparkling wine. Not quite as sweet as most dessert wines, but this is great with birthday cake. This is great with ice cream. This is great with pound cake. This is really good with cookies. And before we wrap up the show, we're actually going to open up this demi-sec and have it with some cookies actually. So we'll be back in a little bit and talk more. What goes best with pancakes? Bella, I'm guessing you love pancakes and we love pancakes in my house too and not even just for breakfast. Now here's the thing when you're having pancakes and if you want to pair a wine with those, not you specifically Bella, but here's the deal. You've got maple syrup you might have some fruit on top of those pancakes. You might have chocolate chips in those pancakes. You might have some really yummy sausage and bacon on the side there as well. So all those different flavors come in, they combine, and they kind of complicate your palate. So you need something that first of all is going to help cut through all those different flavors. And some of them are actually pretty strong flavors. So one of the things I always suggest for those types of meals is a sparkling wine. This is a sparkling rosé from Austria. It probably comes from either the Zweigelt grape or Blau Frankish grapes. And the nice thing about a sparkling rosé is it has a really nice kind of a berry characteristic, which, which I really like because I put berries on my pancakes, do you? And the other thing I like about this is that you've got that acidity and you've got those bubbles, that effervescence, which helps cut through all of those flavors. Now, Bella, when you're of legal drinking age many years from now, I hope you remember all this because I'm going to quiz you on it. In the meantime, here's what I suggest you try with your pancakes at home. Ask mom to pick you up a nice bottle of sparkling apple cider next time you're at the supermarket. Something else to consider or look for when you're looking at the wine labels. A lot of sparkling wines are, are non-vintage, so you'll see an NV, or you'll see no year at all listed on that. And that's okay, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. Uh, it just means a couple of things. It means that that wine is a blend from different years. And remember, non-vintage doesn't mean that it's of lower quality. It means that it's a blend from different years. And for a lot of the houses, champagne and sparkling wine houses, non-vintage is their classic representative house style. Here's another cava, but this one actually is a vintage cava, and it'll say so right on the label, vintage 2008, which means that this was made specifically from the 2008 vintage, no blending from other years. Does it mean it's better quality wine? Not necessarily. Again, it just means, though, that that is the year the wine was produced. The author Aldous Huxley said, champagne tastes like a crisp apple cut with a stainless steel knife. And I think that makes perfect sense because one of the things I love about sparkling wines is that, is that crispness and that acidity and why I think they're incredibly versatile as food wines. You can find a style of sparkling wine or champagne, anything from light in body to really heavy, full-bodied champagne that will go with just about any type of food out there. Eggs, sparkling wines are great. 
popcorn, potato chips, sparkling wines are great. I like to drink sparkling wine where a lot of people will be drinking a beer with their pizza, with their burgers, with, um, with, with Asian food, with, with spicy food, with Latin American food. Same reason why you drink a beer with those is the crispness of that beer, the acidity, also the bubbles which help scrub your palate. Those are all present in sparkling wines. People might say, well, sparkling wines are expensive. Not really. You can get a really good sparkling wine, well-rated, good-tasting sparkling wine now, high single digits on up to the mid-teens. Great with food. Try it next time, not just for special occasion foods, but just for the type of food that you like to have. I love doing this show because I love sparkling wine. It's probably my favorite classification of wine. What prompted me to do this show? Mary Mann from Maplewood Patch said, you need to do a show on sparkling wine. And I said, you know what, you're right. I need to do a show on sparkling wine. And I said to Mary, I said, but I want to invite you and the other folks from Patch in Maplewood, South Orange, Milburn area, because you've all been really good to me. And that's why Laura Griffin's here. And that's why Carolyn Maynard Parisi is here as well. Patch has not only been really good to me, but they've been really good to a lot of the local businesses and all. And, uh, and since this is community TV, they, I, I want to give them a shout out really for all that they've done for the community as well. Not just promoting businesses, but promoting lots of different groups and activities in the community. Um, I also want to thank Linda for having us here. This has been, uh, been great. This is a beautiful space. Uh, thank you very much for opening your doors for us. And, we really do My appreciate pleasure. it. My Thank pleasure. You. It's our, it's Thank been, you. It's our pleasure as well. We're going to take this out with that demi-sec I talked about earlier from Gruet. Uh, as I said, demi-secs are a really nice dessert wine, but not for super sweet desserts. But um, I had the idea this morning to run over to see Julie at the Abel Baker in Maplewood, who makes some fantastic stuff. And I'm pretty certain that this demi-sec is going to go really nicely with these really nice cookies that I got from her today. Uh, again, I want to thank you and a toast to everyone for being here. Thank you. Cheers. For opening your doors, not just today, but to the community every day. Until next time, I'm Hank Zona. Cheers. Thank you.